Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk about how to reverse engineer RC4 cryptography, specifically for malware analysts. We're not going to dive too deep into the algorithm to understand every component of it. We're really just going to focus on the, the key indicators or key components you need to understand as a malware reverse engineer. RC4 is a very widely used cryptography for malware. It's used for two main reasons. First, it has a very small code base and it operates very quickly. That means you can easily put it in your code without taking a lot of room or expanding your file size, and then it'll run very quickly so it won't slow down your file. Second is a reversible algorithm. That means the same function is used for both encryption and decryption. So it just makes it a really simple utility function to code up yourselves, put in the hour, so that you can quickly change out your, your cipher and kind of stay one step ahead of the AV vendors. The intent isn't for, to make an unbreakable cipher. RC4 is pretty simple to decipher and we'll show you how the tank is really just to be able to quickly change out your you know really your hashes so if you're encrypting strings you just quickly change the cipher and you make the hash change and so it's really just to make it hard for av files or av companies to signature on your file so in order to understand how to reverse engine rc4 we need to know the algorithm a little bit to know what to look for so i pulled up this wikipedia wikipedia page on rc4 let's just kind of scroll through the middle here and we'll see this component, the key scheduling algorithm, and this pseudo-random generation algorithm. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to make it easier to see. And we're going to look through just a little bit how this works to know the background. You can see here we have a one loop. And you're basically initializing a substitution box, or S box, to the identity permutation. That's the values of the loop counter, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up through 255. Then we go through another loop that does a little bit of math and takes the key bytes from or bytes from the key, adds them to the S box, and then swaps the values. So all you're doing in the second part of the KSA function is just randomizing your substitution box based on the given input key. So that means everything's initialized to the identity permutation and will always be randomized the same based on the same key. Once you get done that, you have a randomized S box, pass that S box into the PRGA function, the pseudo random generation algorithm function. Here, again, you do a little bit more math and you take a value out of the S box based on the little bit of math, and you generate a keystream byte. A Wikipedia says you output the keystream byte there, and then the next step would be XOR it with the data itself. But in all reality, in malware, or really any compiled code, instead of outputting the value K, you're going to see the XOR at this location with the keystream byte and the data to either encrypt it and decrypt it. That's really all there is to this uh, function. So you can see how easy it is. You can probably do this in like 30 or 40 lines of code which is why it's so frequently used by malware authors. So now that we understand a little bit about the background of the algorithm, let's go into how to quickly identify the components. We can kind of look through here and see what stands out that we can look for. The first thing you want to look for and the biggest indicator is the initialization of the S-Box to the identity permutation. So your S-Box will be initialized to all zeros and then you set the values to the loop counter. And it'll go always from zero up through 255. So Anytime you see a loop that initializes an array to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up through 255, that should be screaming RC4. It could be used for something else, but you probably have a good 98% or at least 95% chance that it's RC4, or at least some variant of RC4. The next thing you want to look for is the use of the uh, 256 constant. You can see down here we have a mod 256, and then in both these loops, we have going from 0 to 255. So the compiled code will almost never go from 0 through 255. It doesn't go from 0 to less than 256. That means you'll have the same 256 constant in this loop and the second loop as well as the modulus operator. If you go down to the PRGA function, we also see several uh, mods of 256. In hex, you're going to see 256 as the 100. And occasionally in the modulus operation, maybe you're doing AND, you might see it with 255 or FF because of how the mod works with the AND. So if you're looking for either the hex constants of FF or 100, 100 will be more common, but FF for the modulus operator is something else you want to look for. The last thing you want to look for is in the PRJ function, you want to look for a single loop that has an XOR at the bottom of it, where we output this K value here. Just look for an XOR of the data byte with the keystring byte here. And those are the three quick indicators you want to look for to recognize uh, RC4. If you want a little bit of higher confidence that it's RC4, there's a few extra things you can look for. First, 
you can you want to see the S box is used in this KSA function and passed into this PRJ function. You see this S of I here and down here is used several times. So if you get one function that you see the uh, initialization as S box to the identity permutation, and that same array is passed into a next function that has a single loop with an XOR at the bottom, then that looks like they're reusing the S box. So that's a, another thing that gives you a higher confidence is RC4. The next thing you want to look for that you can't see in this RC or RC4 page is you want to see the saving the state information. So you can see on this KSA function, you're initializing S box to a default value that will always be the same based on your given RC4 key. Once you get to this PRJ function, it's going to jumble up this S box a little bit more to grab a keystream byte. Based on what your I and J values are, it tells you where you are in the stream. So if we have a thousand bytes of data, we're gonna to have to generate a thousand byte keystream. So if we generate, maybe we XOR five bytes, so that's you know, index zero through four, then the next time we XOR a byte, we can either start back at zero or start back at the index five. If we start at index five, that means we save the state information. If we start back at index zero, that means we disregard the state information and it's a stateless uh, algorithm at that point. If we do save the state information, it's almost always gonna be saved after the S box. So since we come up to this KSA, we see the S box is going from zero through 255, that's hex FF. If you save the IJ values after that, it'll be hex values 100 and 101. So inside this PRJ function, or at least the suspected PRJ function, if you see an S box of 100 and 101, that'll be grabbing the uh, I and J values to be you know, the stateful algorithm. And that's another higher confidence uh, indicator that you're looking at RC4. The last thing you can look for to give you higher confidence is when you look at the XOR and the PRJ function, if it operates on something coming out of the S box and the suspected data, then that's another higher confidence uh, indicator for RC4. So from the simple case, you will always want to look for the initialization the S box to the identity permutation or the index of the loop counter of zero through 255. Then you want to look for multiple uses of the constant 256 or hex 100, as well as use that in mod operations. And then last, you want to look at the PRJ function to have a single loop with an XOR near the bottom. If you see those, then you can be pretty certain you're using RC4 or some kind of variant. And instead of going through and trying to identify every line and matching up to the algorithm to see if it is, because it's so easy to test dynamically, you just want to test it out. If you can put the same data through the malware RC4 function and your alternative you know, code to test it and get the same output, then you know it's using RC4 and it's in a uh, standard implementation and you'll know you have the key. So that's the method we're going to show you how to do today. So now that we know what to look for, the next step is to identify the indicators of compromise. Really the only IOC you need from RC4 is to know the RC4 key. That way you can use it to decrypt the strings yourselves, use it to put it in automatic configuration extractors, if you need to decrypt a file, whatever it is. But the key is only used in the KSA function. And we can see it's in the second loop here. So all you're looking for is you have this key of I mod the key length. So we're really just looking for a buffer that has the loop index mod some value that's not 256 so that we don't get confused with this mod 256 here. While your key can be 256 bytes, it's not that common. So, you know, probably 90% of the time you're looking for a loop index mod some value other than 256 and that will tell you exactly what the key is. From there, we can just extract it from the file, run it through our test simulator and then kind of verify if it's that way or not. If you're not familiar with what the mod value does, let's go over that just real shortly or real quickly. So if we have, let's say we have i mod 4, that's really the equivalent of uh, remain remainder of i divided by 4. So let's see what that does. So if we have basically i, we'll have the, the mod value there. Let's say your i is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we have 1 divided by 4. The remainder of that is, actually, let's start this at 0. Sorry, this is where it went to. Okay. So 0 divided by 4, remainder is 0. 1 divided by 4, remainder is 1. And then 2, 3. 
So 4 divided by 4, the remainder goes back to 0. 5 goes to 1. 6 goes to 2. And 3. 8 divided by 4, remainder is, uh, is 0. And then 9 is 1. You can see all this is doing is making index 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. So if our key equals a, b, c, d, then we have key of i mod 4 really becomes a, b, c, and then we start looping around again, a, b, c, d, a, b, c, d, and so on. So if you look at this KSA algorithm, because we're grabbing a byte out of the key, of the loop index, and we want to grab the same value of S of I. If our key isn't the size of the S box or 256 bytes, then we need to loop around to the key and basically expand it out. So that's what this is doing. So we basically do this 256 times. So our key always becomes the same size as the S box. So that means, you know, so if you have the key of 256 bytes, you won't need this I mod the key length, you'll just have the I, but that's more of a rare circumstance. Generally, the key will be a different length, so you'll see this key of i mod key length. That makes it a really easy way to find that the find the key structure to be able to hold out to use for your cipher. All right. All right. So let's talk about a couple of variations that we see in RC four. So in this uh, our Wikipedia page, we have the key scheduling algorithm and the pseudo-random generation algorithm, they're really two separate functions. And probably 80% of the time, you'll see it that way. But one of the variations you'll see is you may see it as one function instead of two. So instead of seeing the key scheduling algorithm, and then maybe the SBOX output from there passed into the PRJ function, you're gonna see one big function where you do this key scheduling algorithm component, and then just go directly into the PRJ component. That's something you wanna look for. The other thing you wanna look for, a second variation, is this SBOX. Most of the time will be initialized as a byte array. So you have S of like 0, 1, 2, 3 equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. But sometimes the actors will initialize the S box as a uh, int array. That means you'll have S of basically I times 4 equals I. So instead of having you know, S of you know, the byte array, you'll have S of 0 equals 0, S of 4 equals 1, S of 8 equals 2, and so on. So it's just something to keep in mind. You won't always increment s of i by one byte each time through. Sometimes you'll increment it by four bytes if they define it as an int array. The next uh, variation we want to think about is that this s box initialization won't always be standalone. So if we look back at our code here, the i, the key i mod key length is just doing a key expansion. One of the other variations we see is instead of doing an i mod uh, the key length, you'll actually just expand the key out to 256 times. And then you'll use that array inside of here. You'll do expanded key of i instead of the key of i mod key length. If you do expand the key out and do that key expansion, it'll typically be done inside the same loop with the S box because you're already going from the size of the S box. So you know this, if this is standalone and initialize the S box, it's super clear when you see it. If they had the key expansion inside of it, it becomes a little bit less clear and you have to look up a little bit closer. The last variation we want to talk about is that the uh, key scheduling algorithm and the PRJ function will most of the time be next to each other, usually go directly from the KSA into the PRJ function. But maybe 5 or 10% of the time, you'll have the key scheduling algorithm initialize everything, and then sometime later in the code, you call the PRJ function. So they won't always be right next to each other, but they will be the majority of the time. Just be realized it could be different when you're, you're trying to identify this. That really goes over the background of RC4, the indicators we need to look for, and really why we're looking for them. The next thing we want to do is understand how to test out RC4. You can do this several different ways, but I always recommend doing it dynamically. You can do it with tools like Python, you can put it in you know, compiled code. But the easiest way is to use a tool called CyberChef. So I've already opened this up in the second tab here. This is uh, just a free tool on GitHub. And what this does is it's basically a graphical interface to do a large number of crypto algorithms that are handy for malware analysts. So if you go to the search operation, I can just type out RC4. And then if I just double click it, it should pop over here. Now I can fill out the RC4 key, put my input out, and I'll get my output here. 
So it just gives a really way to code things up just as a, a graphical interface instead of having to uh, write down the code yourself. So what we're going to do to test is we're going to run the files in a debugger and we're going to use x64 uh, debugger here. And then you just grab the input bytes out of the malware, put them in the input here, and then run the malware. If we get the same output in CyberChef as we do the malware, then we'll know for sure that we identified RC4 correctly. We'll know it's the standard implementation and we'll know, hey, we had the correct RC4 key. That's really everything we need to test. That's a lot simpler than going back to the algorithm and trying to go through every line of the algorithm and compare it to the assembly to make sure it's the right algorithm. So I always encourage you to do the simplest uh, test first. If it comes out to be wrong, then you go back through and do, do the more in-depth tests. But it's, if you start with a simple one, it works. It just saves you a lot of time. There's no reason to go line by line if you don't need to. So with that, that's really everything we need to talk to about the algorithm. The next step is we have a couple examples that we're going to go through and just show you how to do it. All these examples are listed in the description page. And you can download the files from uh, malshare.com and test it out on your own. Just be aware that these are malware files, so run them inside a VM. And I think one or two of them also might be ransomware, so be extra careful that you don't have your system connected to anything that has files you care about. All right, so we're going to use Ghidra uh, for examples. Let's go ahead to go to the first example. So I'm going to go to the KSA algorithm. This is at address 40charlie940. I'm going to open this up in the graphical view because it's just easier to see. This is going to be our simplest example. And this is a really the standard implementation of RC4, so you can recognize what it looks like. Let's just scroll through this function. We see the function prolog up here, and then immediately we see a loop that should be screaming RC4. We see a single while loop that we're looping through 256 times. We see the hex 100 constant, and we have our loop counter EAX. We initialize the zero here, incrementing through here, and we're storing that into an array of basically I. So ESI is our S box. And we see that comes from ECX. And that's how it comes in this function. So it's probably a fast call function. This loop here is 90% what you need to look for. Anytime you see something this simple, where you have an array initialized to the loop index or hex 100 times, then you should immediately think RC4. And that's almost all you need to do, but we'll check a couple other things for it too. So the next thing we do is we see the second loop. And again, we see the loop exit condition is the 100 constant. So the 100 constants were used again, so that gives us more a confidence. Let's look to see what we suspected the key to be. Remember we said we wanted to find the key inside the second loop. We want to find something where the mod value is used. We see an idiv here with a parameter one. The idiv is one of the most frequent ways you're going to see uh, the mod just operated on the assembly. Let's go back to our notepad and see how that works. So if you have either the div or the idiv of, we'll call it n, that's the equivalent of, equivalent of ax divided by n, then the quotient goes into eax, and the remainder goes into edx. And you remember the remainder is, we'll put it here, remainder or the modulus value goes in edx. So all we're really doing is checking that eax is a loop index, and then we're seeing that EDX is used as the, the modulus operator. So if we look in here, we look at EAX. This comes from EDI. We see it incremented right down here and initialize at zero. That means EDI is our loop index. We're dividing the loop index by unknown parameter. EAX is immediately overwritten, but we're using EDX. So that's everything you need to see to look for the modulus operator. That means this uh, array that we're grabbing the I mod uh, basically param one is the key, and the param one is the key length. So we see our key is loader.json. Let's go ahead and copy this out. Right click it, copy. And then we're gonna go back to CyberChef and we're gonna start filling this out. So our passphrase is just a key. Go we'll paste setting, so it's loader.json. And we'll go back to Ghidra. And then we're going to go up and we're going to label this function. Hit L to label, call this RC4 KSA. Remember the S box is used in this ESI parameter, which comes from ECX. So I'm going to do Control Shift F to find the cross references. And go to the first one called. 
then we're going to let Gija redraw this, and then we'll check for the PRGA. So the PRG function is almost used directly after it most of the time. If we see our ECX here, we select it, we see it's using ECX again, which is likely using the inside this function. So we we'll want to verify that ECX is used inside this function. We'll go ahead and just label this as RC4 PRGA. And if we're wrong, we'll go back through and label it different. But because we think this is a KSA function, the PRJ function almost always follows right after it. So we're going to double click it, and then we'll look for the indicators here. So we're going to look for the hex 100 constants, or for the mod values. So we see, in fact, let's go through this whole thing. So we see the function prologue. We see a little bit of initialization of variables, just kind of saving some stuff off. And then we see a single loop. Exit out the function. Inside of a single loop, Let's see if we see, um, we see the XOR at the bottom here in the single loop. The, what else do we see? Um, and then we see the state information. Do you remember we said that the uh, ECX was the suspected SBOX? And now we see the ECX of, or the SBOX of hex 100 right here and 101 right here. The 101 here and the 100. So that's saving the IJ information where we're actually grabbing the state information out. That's another of the deeper indicators that we want to look for. The last thing we want to look for is the values of 256. So you see here, if we look at the instructions, we don't see in a div, you know, an I div. We don't see an and operation that would do maybe and it with FF. But what we do see here though, you see how we're doing this add? We're adding single bytes here. We're using the AL operations. We have DL here. So that means you're basically using the single byte register out of the EX register to do your modulus operations. So the fact that the single byte will only go up to 255, which is you know mod in 256, then that doesn't inherit mod by using a single byte. So that's one of the other ways. So typically you look for the mod the div or I div operation. That's the most frequent. Then you might see an AND with hex FF. And the other thing you'll see is using a single byte register of the um, extended registers. So now we're basically see that the 256 values are constant use here. We see, but even if that's not that clear, just seeing the SBOX with the 100 and the 101 and then the XOR at the bottom is really all we needed to know for this. Okay. So I'm going to hit Alt left to get back to where I was at. So that's, we're pretty confident this is a PRJ function. So now all we need to do is test this out. This file is really meant to run as a service and this has a couple of things. So let's look through this function here. In fact, I'm just gonna go up, call this function at the top here. So it's a function 403850, the L to label. I'm just gonna call this uh, has RC4, just for now. If we scroll through here, I didn't reverse engineer this whole malware, we just wanna test out the RC4. But I looked at it just enough to see we have this loader.json uh, string here, and it's building out a path. So we have a string slash string. That's usually a file path. In this case, it's actually going to be looking for the file loader.json in the path that the malware is running from. If it can open it, it's going to decrypt it with the RC4 a key. So we're going to go ahead and create a file. Pull up our malware directory. Go we'll do new file. We're gonna call this loader.json. And then let's go back to CyberChef. We're gonna create some data for it. So we're gonna do RC4 test data. And then our output format, we're gonna do a drop down here and output it as hex. Usually you can just save this all to file, but it's not working on my computer. So I'm not sure why that is. So for now, I'm just going to go ahead and copy that with a control C. And then this loader.json, I'm going to open up in the hex editor. Once it's open, I'm just going to paste it in. Then I will save that file and close that out. So now we have an RC4 encrypted file there that contains the uh, RC4 test data string uh, encrypted. So if we can run this file and get it to decrypt correctly, then we know it has the standard RC4 and we have the correct key. So we're gonna run this example one in X32 debugger. So 
So in order to run this, we need to run it with a command line argument of basically a dash stop. We're going to go to file, change command line. We'll go to end here, but dash stop. And it'll reset it just because I never remember if you need to or not. We'll hit F9 to get the beginning. We need to set some breakpoints. So if we look at the memory map here, you see we are loaded at the address 30,000 hex is our base address. Let's look at our uh, Gija. If we come down to this uh, RC4 KSA, we can really skip over that. We just need a breakpoint on the PRGA, and then we can see where it grabs the input from to decrypt it, and then check that it gets the correct output. So I'm going to put a breakpoint on the RVA of 3916. So I can basically just add 3916 to the 30,000 hex in X32 debugger. So I'm going to hit Control G to 33916. This is our function. I'll hit F2 for a breakpoint. So now if I hit F9 to run up to this, I'll go ahead and hit F9. You see we stopped in here. So now we need to figure out what is the data, what the SFOX is. If we go back to Ghidra, like let's go to the graph view. Just for now, so we see ECX was our SBOX, and we see this we're used as ECX here. That means we really just have two arguments passed on to it. Let's go back to X32. If we look at our first argument up at this uh, ESP, we see it looks like a, a address memory, and the second address is the uh, value delta, which is you know, it looks like the length of our RC4 test data. This looks like if I go with the hex view, hit Control G. I go to ESP with brackets. This looks like our encrypted data. And then we have the length of encrypted data, which is the delta bytes. So this won't always necessarily decrypt it in place. Maybe it'll put it into another buffer or maybe it'll return to EAX. But oftentimes it'll just do over, overwrite itself. So I'm just going to hit F8 and see if it works. If it works, then I don't need to look at it any closer. If it doesn't, then I'll look at it a little bit deeper to figure out where the output goes. So I hit F8. And we see here we get RC4 test data. So that means we now positively identified RC4 cryptography. We know it's a standard implementation. We know the RC4 key. And we even know what the arguments are, all with very minimal reverse engineering. We could have went through this all statically, traced all the variables, figured out what everything was, but it would take more time. By finding just a quick indicators and then testing it out, we saved ourselves a lot of time. If it didn't work, then we'd go back through and do it manually and spend a little bit more time. But again, why spend you know, 20 minutes doing this by hand if you can do it in five minutes, you know, just quickly test it. That's all we need to just do to see example one. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out. And we're going to go on to our second example. So the second example is a little bit more obfuscated. It's one of the, um, it's one of the variations. I hit G to go here. And this is KSA is at 4018 Echo Bravo. And I'll open up the graph view because it's a little bit easier to see. So if we come down here, we see we have NOPS but no return. That means this function did not get analyzed correctly. So I go back to the flat view, and you see here it stopped disassembling. I'll select that line, hit D to disassemble. And now let's go back to graph view. We see if we go, oops, get back to, there it is. If we come down here, we see it didn't you'll know, find the end function correctly. So let's close this down. And we're going to select the first line. I'm just going to scroll down until I find the end of the function. And we're just looking until we get to the next function, really, the return right before. So we see here a new function and a return right before. So I go there, right click, and go down to function and recreate function. I'll hit recreate. And we can see a little status bar, progress bar on the bottom right here. We're going to go ahead and once that's done, we're going to open up the graph view. And now it should be analyzed correctly. All right, so I scroll up to the top. So we have all these knobs. In fact, let's just go ahead and label this while we're here. So function 418 Echo Bravo, hit L to label, call this RC4 KSA. Let's scroll through. I see a little bit of initialization code here. I see a hex 100 constant moved into ECX, I see that as the loop counter. So again, anytime you see a while or for loop, 
pulling for 256 times, you should start thinking RC4. It's not guaranteed. This isn't nearly as clear as the previous example where you just had the SVOX initialization, but just having a loop for two or hex 100 times is a pretty a good giveaway that may be using RC4. We scroll, keep scrolling down. We see ECX is moved to EDI. And that doesn't look like, let's see. So here, it's hard to tell what this loop is going for. We're going to do a jump less thing. So we're comparing RAM1 to ECX, which we see is our uh, 256 hex 100 constant. Let's see what pram one. Pram one here is incremented and initializes at zero. So here we're using pram one as the loop index. So again, we're doing loop for 256 times. So we have two loops into 256. It's looking like the KSA function. Let's see if we can identify the SVOX initialization. First, we find the counter. So I see the increment EBX here. I see it initialized at zero. So that's our loop index. I see that stored into an array here because we have ESI of EBX we see the brackets that we're dereferencing. ESI comes from pram1. That means we're initializing an array to the loop index for 256 times. So that's, a, again, the, the big giveaway using RC4. In this case, pram1 is the Xbox, uh, you know, the Xbox pointer. So the question is, what's all this other code doing? We see a div here instead of an idiv, and we see a parameter. Remember the divs often used for the a modulus operator, so we see it's dividing EAX, which is comes from EBX, which is our loop index. So we're dividing I by some parameter. We're overwriting EAX and only using EDX right down here. So we're modding I by basic key length. That would make this EAX our key. EAX comes from pram2. That means pram1 is the Xbox. Pram2 is basically going to be our key, and pram3 is a key length. This is doing the key expansion. So again, instead of using, so you come down here to the next loop, we do see an idiv with EDI here, and that comes from ECX. But remember, ECX is our hex 100 constant. So if we go back to the CyberChef, or not the CyberChef, the Wikipedia page, and we see down here we have a mod 256. So that's what that idiv or that div operation is doing. Because we're doing a div at 256. So this first part, we're, we're doing this uh, mod in the key, we're doing the key expansion. Remember, when we go back to our initial notes, you can either have key of I mod 4, or you can physically expand it out 256 times. And when we mentioned the variation, we said that that would most likely be in this Xbox initialization code, and that's what this is doing. We're taking the key here, taking the key of I mod key length, which is prime 3, Grab that EX, and then we store that byte into basically 408, which is going to be our key expansion. That key expansion, let's see how this gets used. So that gets into EDI. And then up, oh, and you see here we're adding 4 to it. That means the key is not stored as a byte array, it's stored as an int array. So remember when we mentioned when the variation for the S box could be that instead of a, a byte array and increment by 1, it could be incremented by 4. In this case, the key is stored as an array, so you'll see the add four there. Now we see we're adding some bytes, uh, ECX here, to EDI. So we're basically taking our key here. Another oh, no, doing a move. Let's see this 408. Oh, sorry, 408 is moved into EAX here. And this is where the key is getting used here. Um, or moved into pram3, sorry. Gotta look this a little closer. So 408, go to EAX, moved into pram3. And then our pram3, you see we're adding four bytes to get to it. Then pram3 goes into EDX, and we're grabbing those bytes out, adding it. So it's using the key down here. So again, it's a long way to show that you're basically using the key down in the key expansion, or in the uh, jumbling up of the S-Box. But up here is where we initialize the Xbox to the identity permutation. And then we're also expanding the key out. So let's go find the PRJ function. So I'm going to select uh, the function, hit Control Shift F to find the cross references. And we'll go just to the first one here. X out of here. So again, 
I'm just going to assume the next function, it'll label. This is a function 4199 delta. Hit, I'll call this RC4, PRJ. If I'm wrong, I can come back and change it later. But you know, we got a 90% chance that the following function is going to be the PRJ. We have the same problem here. The Gita doesn't analyze it correctly. So I'll close this down. And then I'll come down here, hit disassemble. We're going to have the same problem that the graph didn't get done correctly. We're going to select the range. I'm just going to go down to the next function. I'm actually going to select too much here. So if we go down here, this function will actually end um, right this leave return statement. But if I just want to scroll down until I find the next function, because it's hard to know where the function ends, I'll right click it and I'll do function, create function. And then I will open up the graph view. We'll see what this does. You see if we scroll all the way up to the top here, we have our initialization, the NOPS, uh, initializes some variables. You see our hex 100 constant here. This is moved into ECX and we're doing the IDIV. Remember IDIV of the parameter is mod, basically that value, so we're doing mod 256 several times. So that's what we expected to see in here. We have um, near the bottom of this loop, we have an XOR. And then we can see we are incrementing our local eight, which must be our loop index here and looping back through here. And then we exit out at this leave return. Because I selected more, I basically grabbed some extra bytes here, which went to a different function. So it doesn't really hurt you. So sometimes you just make your best guess and then later you could look at it. And if you want to update it, you can change it from there. All right, so our param one, let's do alt left. Param one of the KSA was the uh, S box, if you remember. Let's see if we see our param one. Again, that's reused as param one of the PRJ. Let's see if we see the state information used or if it's stateful RC4. We can go to see if we find param one. The param one goes into ESI. We have ESI of EDX, which with EDX. Oh, it has the I did there. So it's S box of a value. So I'm not seeing the hex 100 101 constant. So it's probably not saving the state information. So it's a little bit hard to tell that this ESI is the S box, but just the fact that we had the S box identified in the KSA and the fact that I got passed into here, then we know it's the, the S box inside this function too. So as you can see, it's not always going to be as clear as when you have the nice S box of 100 and 101 to identify it. But if you track it or trace it from the KSA function, it'll be pretty easy to identify. So I'm gonna hit Alt left, get back to where I was at. So now, just like before, so we need to find our key. Let's go into the KSA. We'll find the key expansion bytes. We have a div here. So I know my param three is my uh, key length. So I see EDX of EAX which is pram2. So I'm looking for pram2 to be my key, pram3 to be my key length. So alt left to get back. So I'm gonna look, so I'll call this S box. And then EAX is gonna be my pram2, which is my key, local 14. I see a stack string here. I'm gonna right click this, go to convert, R. I'm gonna do this for the whole stack string. Right click, convert, R, right click, Convert car, right click, convert car, right click. This would be a little bit easier if I put a shortcut key for this, but I haven't set the shortcut keys up for this one because I don't do it that often. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this mouse click. Got two more to go. Right click, convert car, and right click, convert car. So we see our key is get on 538 with a capital G. Let's go back to server chef. And then in our key, we're going to do get on 538 with a capital G. All right, now we're going to go back to function. So we have our key identified. So all we need to do is put a breakpoint on this PRGA function. We'll see what's getting encrypted. We'll copy those bytes out into the cyber chef and then verify that we get the same output in the malware as we do inside the cyber chef. And just like before, that'll give us a a way to dynamically verify this is RC4.
So this PRJ function is called at offset one delta three alpha. Let me go ahead and close this down. All right, so we'll do example two, the X32 debugger. And again, the examples are all in the details uh, description where you can get them in Mouseshare to test on your own. Hit F9. All right, we see from our memory map, we're loaded at address 400,000 hex. So I'm going to control G. And here I'm going to go to 401 delta three alpha. Hit F2 for a breakpoint, and this is our PRGA function. So I'm just going to hit. F9, and you see we stopped there. So now again, we need to figure out what the arguments are for the data and the data length. So we could go through the statically, reverse engineer it, trace them back and figure this out, but it takes a little bit of time. I already identified param one as the S box. Then I have param two and three. Three here is two alpha, which looks like a length. And this param two looks like a buffer. So again, I'm gonna take the easy route. I'm just gonna test it out. If it works, then I know it, you know, I did it right and we'll have to look any closer. If it doesn't work, then I'll go back through and statically reverse engineer and identify positively what the arguments are. I'm going to do control G, brackets ESP plus four to go to what I think is the data. And I'm just going to copy out the first, I'll do go ahead and do the first, uh, I'll do the three lines. Even though it's two alpha, it's not the full three lines. I'm going to right click, binary, copy, and go to server chef. I'm going to paste this in the input. I think I changed my input format to X and the output, I'm going to go to Latin one. I see it's a URL and you see I have some random bytes at the end. Remember that's because we have some extra bytes. We see this um, 5D and then basically bad food. That's the default initialization for some of the heap allocation functions. So I can delete the bad food part out and that would be my two alpha, the length. And you can see it just has a URL. In fact, that last 5D might be, part of it might not be. Now we can see, since we got a, a valid string out of it, we positively identified RC4. Once again, we know it's a standard implementation. We know the RC4 key. That means we can write scripts to go decrypt the strings. We can put it automatic configuration extractors. We can use the indicator in your rules to find more samples and so on, whatever we need to do with it. We did all that with very minimal static analysis. We basically just did a minimal effort and then tested dynamically. So it was pretty quick when you need to do it. All right, so that's all we need for example two. Next, let's do example three. I'm gonna pull up example three here. Hit G to go and we go to the KSA again. So this is a 40F echo one zero. Now this one, I'm just gonna go ahead and label while I'm up here. Hit L to label, RC4, KSA. This one's much harder to see. So this is one I wanna show you. The first one was super simple to see. The second one was still pretty easy to see, but a little bit more difficult. This one's a lot more obfuscated, where you'll probably notice it once you have more experience, or as you're reversing it a little bit more in depth, then hopefully you'll see some of the indicators that you'll start to understand. But let's just scroll through here. I see some initialization code, check in the arguments. And then I see a hex 100 constant, uh, two places here, but they're passes arguments of functions. So that's not really screaming RC4. Now I see an exit condition for a loop and it's 100. So that starts me thinking maybe this is RC4. I have a loop here, but it's not really standing, you know, I'm not seeing a standard SFX initialization. But having any time I have a loop for 100 times, hex 100, I should really start thinking, is this RC4? So this local 10, you can see we initialize a zero, we increment down here, this local 10, I'll hit L to label, and call this loop underscore I, or loop index. I do loop I instead of just I, because if I want to select it, it's a lot easier to have a bigger word, where the just the I character is too small to select. So that's just a little tip for doing in Ghidra to make it easy to select. Let's see if I can find something that looks like an Xbox initialization to the identity permutation. So I have, let me see here. So my loop of I, I'm adding it to something. So I don't really want to see that. I see my loop of I moved to a DL. And then I see I store that into ECX. ECX is a local Charlie. And then we add to it loop of I. So that means this ECX is local Charlie of I and we're storing into it DL, which is I. And then 
we're not using that local Charlie anymore inside this loop. So that means this local Charlie is our S box. So we'll hit L to label, call this S box. So you can see here we're initializing S box. So taking S box of I, initializing it to I. So that's the identity permutation. So now we're you know ninety percent sure we're looking at uh, RC four here. So what's the rest of this code doing? Just like before, it looks like we're probably doing a key expansion. Anytime inside the S box initialization, you see uh, basically another mod value with a, a parameter. You're probably doing the key expansion. The param three expect to be the key expansion or key length. Let's see what we're dividing. We divide eax, which is a loop of i, so i mod param three over a eax, and we take where is edx? Here we have edx. So this would be the i mod key length of ecx. So param two would be the key. We store so key of i mod key length in the DL. We store that into eax, which is our local one Charlie. Hit L to label that. I call this key expansion. Let's just see if this gets used in the second anywhere further on. So now I see another loop for hex 100. So again, remember we do two loops for 256 times inside the KSA function. And I see my key expansion used into EAX, grabbing a byte out of there. I see a mod 256. Anytime you see an AND with 800000FF, think of Visual Studios, that's a optimized modulus by power of two. You basically ignore the eight, add one to whatever the lower bit mask is. So add one to FF, it's hex 100. So we're doing mod 256. And if we remember, let's go refresh our memory. In the KSA, we have this mod 256. So that's what the other way. So the mod you're really looking for, looking for the I, the div or the I div instruction, that's most common. You're looking for an AND with FF. Here we're seeing the slightly modified AND, you know, the Visual Studio's way. So AND with uh, eight and then a bunch of zeros FF. Or you're looking for the single byte registers like AL, BL, TL, and so on. So everything here is looking like we're using the, the KSA function. So if we keep on scrolling through here, we see some more functions. So you can see it's not just, you know, it's got a bunch of other stuff with it. So this would make me thinking uh, the KSA, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty confident because I saw what looks to be the key expansion. I saw the mod values. I saw the 256 values the identity permutation for the Xbox. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, but I definitely want to verify this and I don't want to go verify all this statically. This is an FYI if you download this and look at it yourself. These functions with the hex 100 constants, this is actually doing like a heap alloc, you know, for memory for, you know, the Xboxes and the key expansions, you know, for 256 56 times. Let me go to these cross-references, cross -references, control shift F. I'll only have one cross-reference. I'll close it down. So, I, you know, I didn't look what the, the S-Box was, but let's see if we can figure out what the S-Box is. So if we look here, we had this local eight as a first argument, and that's shared with the next one as a first argument. Remember, you can generally take an educated guess if you find the KSA function. The next function is the RC4 PRJ function. If that is the case, we have a shared variable, which is the S-Box and this local eight. That means this pram one, uh, one of these was a key, one was a key length, and then for this PRGA, uh, one of these param three or four, one will be the data, one will be the data length. And those are pretty much the arguments you get. So again, we can go through this statically, try to figure out exactly which parameter is which, or since we're gonna test it out dynamically, we can just look at it, see what looks like a length, what looks like a key or a data value, and we test it out. If it works, we did it almost instantly. If it doesn't work, then we can go back through and do the brute force method, uh, figuring it out our own ourselves. Let's just go inside of here and see, make sure this PRJ function looks like what we expect it to. So I see 100 moved to ECX and a div, so mod 256, 100 moved to ECX and a div, mod 256. So I see my mod 256, I see one loop up here, and I see a mod 256 here, and with eight bunch of zeros and FFs. And then I scroll down, and at the bottom of this whole loop, you see here, loop index, we we'll just call this local 14, the elder label. I, so I see at the bottom, I see my single XOR operation. I didn't see XORs anywhere else. So again, I for the PRGA function, all I'm really looking for is a single loop with 
uh, an XOR at the bottom, which we have, and then a couple mod 256, which we have several of them. I don't see any uh, Xbox of 100 or 101 to save state information. Could be there, could just be a little more obfuscated, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I don't see it, so I'm just going to assume that it's stateless information. And all I need to do to check it is really to look for more data, then longer for the key, and then you'll, or to see how, if it's reused more than once. So. so let me go ahead and hit Alt Left to get back. So just like before, we're going to open this up in X32 debugger. All I'm going to do is set a breakpoint on RVA of 0095. We'll just add that to the base where it gets loaded, just like before. And then we'll check out the data. Actually, sorry, for this one, we don't have the key. So I need a breakpoint on the KSA. I'll look for the key and then breakpoint on the PRGA and check the data that I'm encrypting or decrypting. So I need a breakpoint on RVA 007 Delta and then RVA 0095. All right, so let me go ahead and close out this. This is our last example. We'll open up an X32 debugger. Give it a second to open. All right, I'm going to just F9 to get in the code base. I'm going to go to my memory map. And I see I'm loaded at address echo3 and then 0000. So our base is echo3. All right, so our first breakpoint where it was because my memory is not that good so echo 3 and then we add 007 delta all right so control g echo 3 007 delta that looks off so let me check my memory map again example 3 is echo 3 All right, sorry, uh, okay. I read this off wrong in the code. So if we come back to here, you see it's not at RVA 007 Delta, because this is loaded at hex 400,000. We have a 41007 Delta. This is RVA 1007 Delta. So I uh, misread that initially. So echo three, we're gonna add 1007 Delta. So we're gonna do control G. So basically echo four, 007 Delta. This will have a KSA, and then it'll be the other address. Uh, it's probably going to be this function here. Yep, let's go verify that. It'll be RVA 10095. We can see this is 40095, so that's right, RVA. Go ahead, F2 there. We're going to hit F9 to run up to here. And we broke on our key. So now we figure out the key and the key length. So remember, uh, I think the first argument was probably the S-Box. So let's look here. We have one argument, a uh, second argument, and then a uh, length. So let's go check the code for a second. I believe we identified the S-Box, and that was the prime one. The loop of I, the expansion. So our S-Box, roll up, see where that comes from. Comes from uh, EAX. You know, it comes outside of a function. We're going to allocate space there. Box, this is the second loop. OK, so you can see this isn't super clear. So I'm not going to spend any more time looking at it. I'm going to take out a test. I'm just going to look at the arguments. I'm going to, so I see this first uh, argument. So I control G, I go to ESP. So because I only have one length here, which looks like it be a four, I'm expecting my key to be four bytes. So here, I see zeros. So obviously a key is not going to be all zeros, or it's very likely not going to be. So I'm going to control G, and go to ESP plus four, and check the next buffer. Because you can see we basically have a buffer, a buffer, and then a length. Now this buffer, I have four bytes. And so that looks more like, likely the key. So I'm going to test that out. Could be wrong, and if it is, I'll go back in Ghidra, and I'll reverse engineer to identify exactly which argument is what. But in this case, I'm just going to right click, Go to binary, then copy. Go back to my server chef. Put this in my key, control V to paste it in, and change my input for the key, drop down, and do hex. All right, now go back to X32 debugger. F9 to get the PRGA. So again, let me look. 
if we remember uh, from this code, let's hit Alt Left to get back out of here, where the KSA is called. Remember we had this local eight was the one value shared between the KSA and PRJ. That first argument is gonna be the S box is only shared variable. We only need to look at the second and third parameter. So if we look here, our second parameter looks like a memory address and the third parameter looks like a length, so 14 F5. So I'm gonna assume the second one is the data. So I'll go to brackets ESP plus four. And because the length is 14 F5, I'm just gonna grab a big chunk. I'm gonna select it, right click, binary and copy. Go back to um, our Cyberchef, paste it in. And we see this doesn't look like anything decrypted. So let's look to see if we did stuff right or not. Right, let me look back at CyberChef. So we have our keys, Bravo, 7 Echo, 4.3, Delta. Um, our input is hex. Input a key is hex, output. Let's go ahead and hit bake here. I think it didn't work. Okay, there you go. So you can see, look like we've got the right information. So CyberChef, if you use on the internet, is almost always gonna work. We download it into the VMs. Sometimes it won't update quite correctly. You can see there, even though we update the input, it basically had some previous information stored. If I hit in bake, it re recalculated. And now we see we got uh, decrypted. So this one is our ransomware. This is actually the configuration file. You can see we have this MPK, basically a JSON file. We have a basic four value. We have the mode, threshold, uh, names, some type of mask, uh, a mail to, mail address here. So now, once again, we identified RC4 was used. In this case, it was much more complicated to see. So if you don't recognize that one at first, don't be worried, that one takes more experience to recognize. But once you know it, we test it out. We dynamically verified or identified what the key was and verified it. We know it's a standard implementation. We have the key, so again, we can write a script to decrypt the, all the strings. We can do automatic configuration extractor, use for the R rule, everything else we need to do. Let's go ahead and close that down in X32 debugger. And so that's really everything we need to talk about for RC4 today. So. We went over the quick identifiers as well as a little bit more in-depth identifiers or higher confidence how to identify RC4. We saw how to pull out the IOCs, which is basically the key. And then more importantly, how to test that dynamically. I wanna encourage you to always test out RC4 before you put it out and report or share the indicators. It's very easy to have something that looks like RC4 and have it be slightly off. Probably 80% of the time, 90% of the time, it will be standard RC4. But either 10 or 20% of the time, it will either be a modified RC4 algorithm or it will be coded slightly incorrectly. If we go back to Wikipedia, and probably when I see it a modified, more often than not, it's coded incorrectly. Sometimes instead of going from 0 to 255, it's basically doing less than 256, they do less than or equal to 256, which is a slight uh, flaw in the implementation. Maybe in the PRJ, they forget to initialize the IJ values at zero. There's a lot of mistakes you can make, you know, usually between something like the less thing or less than equal sign, maybe the mod they did mod 255 instead of mod 256. There's a number of things they can do incorrectly. And so you always want to test it out. There's nothing worse than putting out a report that says it uses RC4 and have somebody go through and try to verify and have it wrong. You see how easy it is to, to verify. But now you know how to identify RC4, you know a little bit of background, you know why it's used, and you know how to pull out the IOCs and test it dynamically so that you can basically further your reverse engineering skills and put out uh, better information. So I hope you enjoyed the information today. If you did, please like the video and subscribe to my channel so you'll get notified when I put new content out. And until next time, uh, keep on practicing and just try to learn something new every day.